thought I would ask, I like asking this of, of organizers, um, about your HIV origin story. So how, do you remember how you got started in doing HIV or community work? Okay. Um, let's see, well I was a student of yours in a, uh, <laughs> in a art and uh, HIV workshop in San Francisco in the early 90s. That was the this? first time. One summer, yeah. That was not the first time. Uh, not the first time, okay, all right. So <laughs> anyhow, we, we go way back. Um, so, I, well, I came out when I was a sophomore in uh, college. This is in UC Santa Cruz. Um, so I was an art major, so I started making work uh, around gay, Asian sexuality. Yeah, so, yeah, so this is 1992, 91, 92. Yeah, so it was inevitable that you know, it was uh, unavoidable, you know, that HIV AIDS would be, you know, a key component of uh, everything that I do in terms of my artwork and my, my scholarship. Yeah, so after college, I moved to San Francisco and got involved with a uh, gay Asian AIDS organization, particularly uh, API Wellness Center. Yeah, so I was involved with that, and yeah, so that's where I got my <laughs> yeah, start. Then, as you say, the inevitability, but also the, um, the, the embrace and the commitment that's been longstanding in your work. And how about you, Emma? Mine's kind of interesting, so I would say two parts. Um, one, so... I grew up in New Orleans, I was there from first grade on, and I had one of the first like figures that I knew that was very New Orleans, whose house we went to for Mardi Gras, who had the best gumbo ever, Uncle Walker, he passed. And that's when, when I found out that he passed. I think my parents weren't like hiding it or anything um, that he passed of um, AIDS complications. That was one of the things that really stuck with me. And I was probably, I was under 10. But then also, um, the organization I work for, my mother started it, and her background. So I, I, it started in 1993, and I was like nine years old, finding female condoms all around the house, and like learning about these things and having conversations that most nine-year-olds aren't having. So I grew up in the organization, and when I was a teenager, we had a lot of programming, and so we used to have a really, really bad access TV talk show, and we would always come up with the topics, and a lot of it, a lot of our early grants and things were around HIV AIDS prevention with young people. I would go to the mall and interview people about it. Didn't go very well. Um, but that was kind of the start within that realm. And then also we took a trip to Ghana when I was in 2001. And we did work there as well. And we were talking about, it was around HIV AIDS prevention and awareness. And what stuck with me a lot was that we went to one conference and the folks that were there were like, there were doctors that were talking about um, the prevalence and different things. And then there are people like journalists that would stand up and say, well, you know, this really did, wasn't an issue until those Nigerians came and did this. And so I started to see the stigma play out in different ways, and I think these experiences kept happening. I kept working with the organization. It kind of took me in that direction, and then we started making short films and... And built from there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I like asking the question because for so many of us, it's a deeply personal um, and, and, and the story just comes right out. And, and then in the case of both of you, as you just said, um, these practices end up building over many, many years in many, many places. And you've both experienced this program, which has been running throughout the week on multiple sites across the country and around the world. You've each experienced it, right, in San Diego, New York. So I was curious, you, you each have a video, one of seven in the program, and what seeing your work in the context of the larger program still beginning did to make you think about your work any differently or, or in the context of the other work? I feel boring. <laughs> I'm like, everyone feels more experimental and more all these different things happening and got to play with the form a lot more and I wish I had done that more. But that said, I think it is interesting to bring Sion's voice into the conversation. One of the things that, you know, seven minutes is short, so when you try and get everything in seven minutes, you have to cut a lot. And one of the things that she just talked about was you don't see women like me when we talk about HIV AIDS. We don't see black women. We don't have the conversations. Imagine if people see me more and hear my voice more. And she's very vocal, as you can see, about that. Um, and so kind of seeing that within the mix, I was happy to see her voice represented um, and yeah, and create space for that. Yeah, and she has a beautiful blog, Melting Insecurities, and she's like my not quite recent, but still recent kind of experiences. And there's a way that I feel like, I don't know if it was how, how intentional it was, but the structure of your piece really speaks to the structure of her blog in some ways. And I feel like your piece sits 
somewhere between a blog, which is a share, as a way to build community, right? She talks about the other women reaching out to her and a PSA, which would be to say to bring it to people who may not otherwise know. And so I thought the, the way you structure and, and craft her story draws from her practice itself in a way that I really appreciated. Um, how about you, Huang, seeing it in context? Um, for me, what's really exciting, um, seeing all these works together these past uh, uh, few days, is um, the different like manifestations of community. Yeah, it's, like, it's really exciting. Uh, and also in terms of uh, intergenerational dialogue. Yeah, so I mean, for me, one of the, yeah, I really appreciate Derek uh, uh, Woods Morrow. Which is the first film the that opens in the park. With the gay cruising, yeah, the conversation between an older, uh, you know, black uh, gay man, I guess, and a, and, a, and the filmmaker, Derek himself. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Viva's piece, you know, yeah, that was also excellent. Um, you know, this, um, you know, I guess her, I guess stepmother, trans, uh, yeah, Chloe, uh, uh, yeah, representing that figure, and then you know, this kind of a tribute to her, her, her work and her life. And then with my, my work, I think the intergenerational dialogue and the community aspect comes together because. Um, in a really bittersweet way, because you know, I, these are different people that I've uh, encountered, yeah, uh, in uh, the past 25 years. So, uh, folks like Richard Fung at the beginning and at the end, kind of like book ending. He's like a, a big hero of mine. He's a, a, a video artist, a cultural critic, professor, writer, uh, who's done a lot of um, groundbreaking work around you know gay Asian identity and sexuality. Um, yeah, so other folks. Uh, like Ming Ma, who's, who's in the room here, who, you know, as you're talking about how did I get into, you know, activism and art, like Ming recruited me when I was still, I think, like a junior, maybe, a sophomore, like very young. <laughs> he recruited me in his... We get a uh, mic in the audience, right? please. In, in his uh, excellent uh, uh, documentary called Slanted Vision. So around, you know, HIV, AIDS, gay, Asian, American identity. Um, yeah, and, uh, and younger folks that I met, uh, the youngest person is, is uh, Dixon, who's a graduate student uh, in Philadelphia. He's, he's 27, I think. Yeah, so this range of like, you know, someone who's in their 20s, and then, you know, Richard, who's just retired. Um, bring all of them together. I, mean, I wish we could actually be in a physical space together, but, you know, the, the closest thing <laughs> is to have them. So I asked them to send me, yeah, like, so the, the, the uh, email solicitation was five, uh, you know, I remember phrases from uh, 30 years ago that they, you know, recall, and uh, five I remember phrases 30 years into the future. Yeah, so there's this mixture of, you know, history, memory, uh, fact, uh, and fiction, and also fantasy. You know, I, I, I told them they don't have to be true, you know, you can just embellish them or make things up, right? <laughs> Especially at the end, I hope it, you know, with the Trump stuff, I hope it comes true. <laughs> Huang is a conjurer. Um, yeah, and I mean, your choice of the soundtrack, you know, she's talking about fantasy, mystery, come into my world, and, um, and Cirilla Domene is here, amazing artist, working a lot in fibers right now, but you all went to school together, right? So the, these layerings of community, and it, I was struck that in each of your titles, I is present, this very powerful first person claiming of space, right, and, sh and sharing, even testifying to experience, but it's immediately relational out to community, whether it's organizations, outreach, lovers, family, chosen or blood, um, the complexity of relationships and desire. And I, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. This, it's so important to HIV work and to building community, as you both just said. How did that structure your thinking, that challenge of editing, et cetera, this, this dance between the I and the we? Oh, that's a hard one. For me, I think that well, A, I was just like, Sian, can I just follow you? Can I just follow you for a few days and see what happens, see you. Um, I came really good friends with our kids as well. Like, they would come hang out. They, they went to the screening in New Orleans, and I gave her a heads up beforehand that they're like five and 10, <laughs> or maybe eight and 10. Like, it gets graphic at the beginning. She's like, they'll be fine. But she just has just a welcome opening energy and spirit, and so, a, she immediately, anyone around her becomes part of the we, her story, like, I think she just kind of, she brings people in with her spirit, but at the same time, I knew this was, it was her. 
And Angie also was a great piece to kind of give context, and we talked about this a little before, to kind of place it within a larger narrative. But at core, the second you get a hint of Sion, you're like, okay, I want to know more about you. Keep t like keep talking. Let's go. Let's like just kind of delve into that. So for me, I was trying to have the we less of the um, side of the organization, of the side of my own self within it, um, but really also for her community was a key piece. And so a lot of what also I didn't get to show is that she would do like Zoom calls. I really wanted to record one of those, but then there could be issues with people with their own um, feelings about that. But she'll put a call out on Facebook and say, hey, um, anyone want to join me? If you have questions, if you are positive, if you're not, doesn't matter if you wanna have these conversations, it's what we're talking about. And so a lot of what she does is trying to create new community and trying to find these spaces. And like you said, you kind of want them all in the room, but you can't always do that. And so that's why tech is a big piece for her of how she's able to connect with folks. So even as she's very much talking about herself and her experiences, she's always trying to find the we within that and connect to more people and break down stigma and break down barriers. So I think I try to balance that to some extent. Yeah, it makes sense. And to your point, like she's constantly, as I, I called it the relational, she's always bringing that forward through the blog, that outreach moment you show where they're giving the condoms that looked like it was in a Walgreens or something, right? At the drugstore. Walgreens, her, exactly. A couple of those stills of her at conferences, right? And then, you know, Angie's beautiful celebration of her, she's like, we're in good hands, like the, the future is bright, gives me a lot of hope to work with somebody like Sian. And I feel like Huang Yu, there's incredible depth to each of those 10 responses that people gave you, I'm sure, but you also went really wide to weave your complexity and how, how could you do that? I mean, you sent 50 emails out, is that right? Yeah, I sent out 50 emails and, you know, knowing that, you know, uh, uh, expecting, uh, you know, a little less. So I, I got around half uh, of the people who responded. Um, yeah, so I got a, a lot of, of phrases. Some people went over the 10. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a floodgates. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, uh, yeah, so it was exciting. So I, my, my uh, partner helped me code all these different, <laughs> you know, so we had like, uh, you know, like a gay sex, safe, safe for sex, mourning, activism, uh, aging, <laughs> the future. Um, yeah, so uh, for me, so I, I needed to uh, have a structure, right? So I think, uh, different ways of thinking about the, the structure that, that I ended up uh, with in the video is to do with, you know, um, from mourning to activism to, uh, let's see, uh, uh, let's say uh, sexual practices, including safe sex, prep, and then, uh, let's say, the future, right? Aging and then the future, right? But also when think about in terms of uh, the past, the present, the future, or history, memory, and then fantasy. Yeah, so different you know, ways of thinking about you know, uh, what the skeleton, the organization uh, came down to. But, you know, going back to your comment about, you know, the I and, and the we. So one of the techniques that I, I noticed, you know, over the years making videos, like, uh, I like to compile things. Yeah, so uh, uh, kind of making an effect through accretion, like adding, adding, adding. Yes. Yeah, so uh, um, say some 20 years ago, I made a, a, a short video called Maybe, Maybe Never, but I'm counting the days. So... Uh, so this was a video about young people, young queer API. Um, uh, I, I asked folks, you know, like friends of mine to share with me. So the phrase is, I, I've never blank, yeah? And, and this is the drinking game. But so dealing with, you know, uh, sex, desire, longing, risk, regret. So I've never given you a blowjob in an elevator. I've never learned how to pronounce your name. I've never, you know, uh, 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 held your hand in public, et cetera. So I, so I see this piece is called like a companion. Piece, you know, like uh, you know, like 23 years later, yeah. So the, the thing is for me, it's like the eye is not just about, I mean, it's very powerful as a, a personal testimony, but I think it's also a perform, performative eye, yeah. And with the accretion of these different, or compilation of different eyes, it becomes a community, yeah. So uh, for me, even, even though there are people who are reciting their own, you know, phrases, they're actually kind of performing it or, or connecting it. And I think people, when, when they, People laugh, you know, I think that's a sense of recognition. It's not just you, but it's also me in the audience as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely, and, and I felt your piece. There was a really strong and beautiful sense of talking amongst ourselves, even though it's of course accreted and assembled in the work itself. They weren't literally in a room together, but there are all these crosstalks that are implied and, and just outside of what's declared, as you said, it's not just the testimony, right? But there's this implication of what's also there. And um, I, 
it was a little tricky in this version, and I really appreciate the commitment to access that Visual Aids has in, in having the text scroll on the bottom. But you make a choice in the middle there. I mean, you start with no visual and Richard's voice bringing us in, right? And then these series of, of you know, direct addresses. But then you drop the visual out and you do this scroll of text that I had to write them down. They're so mm. powerful that we can't quite absorb on, on purpose, right? right and yeah. so I wonder if you could just speak a little bit to this really nuanced and complicated approach to voice. Mm. And when it's audio uh, or, or, or audible, I guess, when it's textual, mm. um, when it's one-to-one -one with what we see, you're, you're doing a complex weave there. And I wonder if you could speak to those choices. Yeah, I think it's, it's a, a gesture uh, to the fact that, you know, a five minute, Piece, you know, it's just impossible to do justice to the, you know, uh, the different voices, the different contribution. It's just, you know, uh, editing this piece was so emotional and, and you know, wrenching for me because on the one point, you know, it's you know, sad but funny, bittersweet, yeah, and also thinking about moments, you know, that people shared, you know, was really honest and powerful. Yeah, so I think, you know, with that, it's impossible to read it unless you slow down the video, right? Yeah. Um, so I think it was like. Kyle's, uh, I think it was the, the, the HIV doulas group, yeah, gave me some feedback, because I, I, uh, the first version was like much slower. It's still fast, but like a, a lot slower than what you see here. So I think, yeah, so one of the suggestions was to either slow it down so you can, you know, th so the viewer can read everything, you know, and consume it, or speed it, you know, way the hell up, so it's impossible, yeah. Yeah, and, and not to be too much of a design geek, but even the color choice of that kind of fuchsia on blue, right. there's this intense vibration, right? Even as there's the voiceover and these really, you know, complex, I wanna put a pin in what it was like to do that editing and sit with the material that Dredge helped you code and, right, right. and, and just ask you about sound because there's a right. bunch of different ways you're approaching from that opening piano to, of course, Sian's voice, which you presence, but, yeah. Phil, that's not just Phil, it's, it's, it's important for space. So do you want to say anything about how you thought about sound with this piece? Sure. Um, for In the score space, it was hard to figure out what tone to hit, really, because I think that it's overall the piece. She's so light and bubbly and airy, but if it was light music, it would feel too dismissive to me for what she was saying. So I was trying to have something that felt um, not heavy, but had more weight to it in a different way. Uh, but then it's also like it's New Orleans, and I try to represent that a little bit. So the horn comes through when we see New Orleans. So for that side of it, that was one thing for me. But I think a lot of also her work is outside. It's in community. It's in conversation. So even when they're at Walgreens and there's that weird music in the background and all the checkout and all that stuff, I think I really wanted that to be a piece of the experience as well. So you're like, this is the kind of work. This these are the spaces. This is where this happens. Um, and then I think just also that gets into balancing of the voices, of Sian's voice, because also Angie speaks like this. She's so soft and so quiet. She is the pastor's wife and so put together. And then Sian's like, hey, how you doing? This is me. And so even balancing their energies and how they came together was something that I was trying to pay attention to as well um, and what that brings into the space. But Sian's laugh just resonates. And so as much as that could kind of, even if it started to feel more serious, that lightens and takes the energy in a different place. And so wherever that could be and just brighten up um, the piece was important to me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And the rhythm of each of your pieces, you know. Um, you've both alluded to it. One of the things I appreciate, Kyle and Esther, about this program, how many years now we've been doing videos? Is it four or five years already that, that Day Without Art has been taking the video program approach? Five years, so um, is that, you know, they're more than snapshots but not full immersions, right? And it's a real challenge to the artist to say as much as people are wanting to say in those seven minutes. You both already alluded to it. I wonder if there's a, a, a puddle of tears on the editing floor uh, or, or <laughs> you know, in the timeline, as it were, of what was hard to, to, to leave out that didn't make it or that almost begged it being its own piece, you know? Well, I edited with the... Um with the thinking that I would make a longer piece, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, again, I'm sorry, Ming, but <laughs> just to Ming, uh, Ming suggested to me just this week that uh, I should turn it into a script, uh, uh, you know, like a, a printed text, gathering, you know, uh, the 200 something, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that I got. I have a question for Iman, though, yeah. So I was really struck, because I've seen uh, this program, I think, 
three or four or five times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I was really struck by uh, the framing of Sian's uh, 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 face, like when she's sitting in front of the the, the screen, because you know the camera gradually moves move, moves around like towards the back of her head. Yeah. So what what motivated that decision? When she's typing and everything. Yeah. Uh, space limitations in my office, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to see how I could have one. I always like to have just one camera going and then one I can roam and play yeah, with yeah, and yeah. second cut in between. But I really wanted to also just make sure it, that's a huge Mac. And so like since tech and her conversations and her um, interactions with folk are online so much, I just kind of also liked how it took up. It was like if you look at it in thirds, it was her face and the computer. And mm. I think that's a lot of her interactions. And so as I was rushing to get it mm -hmm. all done and find space. I was like, well, I definitely have to be able to capture something where you see her um, with her blogs and interacting in that way. Yeah. For me, it's like it positions me as a viewer sort of like alongside, you know, next to her, over her shoulder, that kind of sense of relationality, even though it's a very simple strategy, right, moving the camera. So it's not, she's not just, you know, the generic like uh, three-quarter, you know, when you're doing an interview with someone, let's say on the news or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was struck by that. Yeah. Thank you. I also think I had so much talking head footage. I was like, how can it be different? How can I change it up? <laughs> so. Yeah, it's also your gesture, Huang, made me realize that you're, you're very present with her. There's a lot of pushed in, right? It's not just close up in film language, but um, you're right there with her. And, and as you did that gesture, it made me realize that. You also went to one of the things that I was ready to ask, which is, what do you want to ask each other? about your pieces or about your work in general? And Juan got us started, but is there something that his piece makes you want to ask him? There are multiple things. One, I did want to read all of the stuff scrolling. Oh, okay. So now I have to, every time I try, I was like, okay, this time yeah, yeah. I'm going to start from the bottom and see if I can catch them. <laughs> right, and so right. it's very interesting to hear that it was like speed it up or slow it down. That um, makes a lot of sense in that way. Uh, I, what I found really fascinating, and you kind of got into it more now, I didn't think about it. I didn't really realize that it could be future until the last, the Trump piece. Mm -hmm. And so it makes me now want to go back again and try and guess what's the past stuff, okay. what's the present, what's right. like, like how did you weave that? Because even some of the statements feel like they could be this person's present, but now I don't know. And it opens up a whole new world when you learn that it can be also 30 years in the future. So I don't know, did you try and balance how much of that happened? Or? Ah, it was, well, you know, on a practical level, I also wanted to make sure that everyone has, like, sort of equal screen time. You know, like, yeah, I mean, uh, in terms, because people sent, uh, uh, you know, spend a lot of time, right, sending video footage, you know, from their cell phone or, or, or webcam or whatever, but also uh, in terms of audio recordings. Yeah, so uh, folks, you know, whose voices, you know, so the face is not on screen, but their voices are. Also, people who just sent, like, texts. Yeah, so I wanted to allow people different ways you know, of sharing rather than, you know, you gotta send me a, you know, really crisp, you know, like high resolution picture of yourself. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so it's more, I guess, more organic rather than, you know, in terms of, you know, we should have three more future directed material. And then, yeah. But one thing that would, that would uh, surprise me was I got one response from a really good friend who is a visual artist, video maker, we used to show a lot together in, in the 90s. Um, he refused. He wrote back and said, Huang, I, you know, he's made work about AIDS himself before, yeah? But he said, you know, Huang, I, I fully support this project, it's important, yeah? But he says, I, I, I can't do it. So I, I refuse to remember. I'm still, I'm not over it. Yeah, so it kind of disrupts my assumptions that, that we would, you know, everyone would want to, you know, at the same place to, to you know, uh, ready to share, you know, with the public, with friends, uh, you know, with, with strangers. Um, the idea that there's this kind of coercion, like, you know, to, to memor memorialize or recollect, yeah. Um, yeah, so that really took me aback. Yeah, and then, of course, I wrote to him immediately. I said, can I use, can I quote you yeah, in my yeah. video? <laughs> so here you are right. getting it into the comments, yeah, right? right? <laughs> Anonymously. But it turns out that there were qu quite a number of folks who actually sent these kind of meta, uh, uh, you know, I remember, you know, like, uh, I remember, like, one of them was uh, Leroy's. I remember when people still remembered AIDS. 
or uh, Michael Shawana Sai, the one, the person who just said, um, a cock is a cock is a cock. He also just ignored my, I remember he said, I forget. <laughs> he said a whole bunch of like, I forget. <laughs> I forget. Yeah, yeah but that was very really interesting. So that's why I wanted to mark that with uh, Fan Popo at the end where he says, I remember. And then in, in the original footage, that's like, you know, 20 seconds of him not saying anything. Yeah, so I wanted to also, yeah. Register that. I thought that was such a rich ending. Go ahead, please. Oh, no, I'd like to how you kind of... <laughs> that one, I wanted to know if he ever said anything. And my second question is um, your color scheme, how you kind of <laughs> right. decided upon that. Right, okay. Uh, he, 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 he does, yeah, f yeah share a few uh, phrases. But yeah, for me, this is kind of like uh, uh, going back to that video I just mentioned before, maybe never. This is the, the, the uh, an analog video aesthetic from the 80s and, and 90s. Yeah, I was, I learned how to edit on the toaster. Yeah, <laughs> three, quarter, uh, three quarter inch video. Pato was there when I was, you know, doing some of this stuff. Yeah, so that kind of like, you know, very retro aesthetics. Yeah, I wanted to harken back to that. I'm still very much, you know, uh, yeah, uh, a fan of that kind of, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, yeah, splashy aesthetics, I guess. I, I think yeah. it also keeps the piece from, like, I can remember as you all came in, memory isn't only there in the past, and certainly HIV memories aren't only in the deep past, they're ever unfolding, still beginning as it were, right? And so there's something about, um, you, you keep us through that aesthetic, and I'm glad you raised it, the sonic aesthetic and the visual aesthetic from only being nostalgic, right, or wistful. And it allows also the pleasure, like, because it seems strategic that I remember dancing, right, active, now, moving, and implied with others, like, it, right in the title itself. Um, I also wanted to ask you both about sex positivity, which is so central, I think, to doing good HIV prevention and care and community building, and you each approach it differently and your subjects approach it differently, but it's right there on the shirt, you know, I suck almost indiscriminately, <laughs> right? Um, and it's there at the end in the kind of hearkening to the future orgy, right? Um, and Sian's very fluid in how she talks about the way she navigates, particularly stigma, but also her own pleasure implicitly. And I wonder if you can each speak to, to how, if and how you thought about that in the structuring of the work and, and the ways you presenced it. Please. I think for Sian, well, one thing that I love about her is that also like she's very, like she, her kids saw this, they saw all the cuts of it, and she's not hiding her sexuality in front of young children, you know, and any part of who she is. And so if she's bold and brazen within that way, because we do a lot of um, sex ed in schools and outside of schools in New Orleans and, and throughout Louisiana, so I know a lot around attitudes and parents' attitudes around uh, these topics, and hers is unique. And so to talk about that so openly, I think it was important to represent that as well. And a lot, I mean, a lot of her blogging gets into that very personal side of her and very personal experiences. Some of the cutting room, or I guess there's not really a cutting room floor anymore, I said the timeline, but some of that was also conversations she had around disclosure and laws. And I thought about being in an existence where like your sexuality is criminalized in such a way and how that impacts how she moves through the world and just how her, the choices that she has to make. And she had a very important, but it was hard to include, just time reasons, um, conversation around um, disclosure and that type of discrimination. So I was trying to also not keep it on the negative side and kind of focus on that part um, because she's so positive in how she speaks about you know, about her experiences and how she doesn't, she doesn't hide from talking about sex at all. And I think that, but at the same time, I don't know, I don't even know, I think I'm trailing now. <laughs> so I'm gonna pass. I think you spoke to it quite well. Um, do you wanna say anything, Hong? Sure, yeah, I mean, uh, it reminds me of this, this lyric with this song that's from the 90s. It's, People are still having sex, yeah? So I think even <laughs> at the height of the, you know, the epidemic, People would never stop having sex, yeah. And for me, uh, in terms of Asian American, you know, communities, like young people, I, you, one, I seldom hear, uh, you know, let's say an accented, you know, uh, Asian voice saying like, you know, uh, you know, I love to get fucked up the ass. Well, I guess maybe you see it here in pornography once in a while, yeah. But for me, I, I just, for me, it's a big turn on to hear that. But so also to make, you know, like, um, 
to make spaces or, or for, for those kinds of phrases to be spoken aloud and embrace. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's always been important to me. Yeah, that, that you, to point that out, like people never stop having sex. Right. And yeah, and, and, and to, uh, to advertise that. Yeah, yeah and it, it pulses through all your work from your scholarship to you know, the long body, large body of video work that you've done for a long time. And, and we open there in the program itself with Derek, right? And that really, the, the wisdom of the elders saying, humans have always been doing this. Um, we have a 9 p.m. heart stop, so I want to maybe open to the room so that we have some time to hear what's on your mind and, um, and also have a little time to kiki. So do we have any questions or comments for our amazing artists? Looks like we have one in the back there, maybe. Hello? Okay. Um, I have a question for Wong, um, it, which is actually more of a comment, but it sounds like from the earlier discussion that the videos were all pre-recorded and sent to you, that they weren't conducted on Skype or anything like that. And so this is just to really echo a lot of the comments that have already been said, which is that that was quite shocking to understand because um, I was really sure that every single person in the videos was talking directly to you. Um, and so the, your, your sort of ongoing presence in that sphere, even when you're not, you're not behind that camera, is both interesting in terms of the history of documentary, but it's particularly interesting in terms of you know, this really consistent reading that you're having about the we or, or the relationality across the entire program for tonight. And I'm very persuasive director. <laughs> Watch out. No, I mean, in the early 90s, it was very you know, easy to get people to take off their clothes and have safe sex on video. Yeah, for, you know, for, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, I, I, I made a, a safe sex video to enter the Stop 8, uh, uh, you know, safer sex contest. I, we came in second. Yeah, and also uh, my friend Cirillo was in the back. And I also, you know, um, uh, uh, participated in APAIT, uh, uh, you know, uh, this uh, safer sex poster, yeah, that, that we made together. And there was there was supposed to be two people. One is uh, Napoleon, uh, 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 and, and the first, the other person didn't show up. So the person who was coordinating, Sean, yeah, took off his clothes and went. They both went at it for the. <laughs> yeah. So I think you know, and also I think the reason why there's this trust, you know, that this. Uh, that, was, that, that my friend's colleague sent me these, these tape, very personal, right, uh, 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 sort of recollections and fantasies, is that I think this, uh, the, the firm uh, commitment and belief to the importance of, you know, uh, 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 HIV awareness, but also, you know, uh, um, was it, uh, recording it, right, for posterity, right? Because these kinds of memories and recollections seldom get, you know, archived anywhere, yeah. Yeah, I mean, all that's beautifully said, and you are very persuasive, but I also think even in that story about your invitation and, and someone claiming their right of refusal, there was also respectfulness to you in the process. And so maybe to your point, I too felt like there's so much behind these 50 emails and that feeds the invitation itself, even if it results in a no, I'm not going to remember, or I'm going to uh, recharacterize the prompt into forgetting, et cetera. There, was already that um, continuity with you and your practice and the relationships that fed it. What else do we want to ask? Esther? So this is directed at, at anyone who wants to answer it, I guess, to, to both of you. But um, what's interesting, there's a thread that runs through all of the films, for the most part, which is that the filmmakers your, both of you included, felt very strongly that the subjects tell their story. It's not a filmmaker having a perspective even or, or telling a story. It's that each of the, the subjects are really telling their own story and that was very, in an interesting way, sort of independently of each other, all of you kind of came to that same form and, that, and felt very, it feels very important to the films. And I wonder if you could speak in your own work about that. Um, as, as the filmmaker, how do you think about making sure your subjects are the ones that are really telling their story without your voice in it too much? I'll 
let's start. And it helps me correct the answer before that I didn't love. <laughs> um, a lot of the work I've done, specifically at iOS, um, has been telling, hasn't been able to be me telling my stories. And I also have deference to people when they tell their stories. And a lot of the work specifically around HIV AIDS prevention has been with teens. And so what we would do, we kind of, the grant funding we had had us do role model stories where we would interview somebody where they make a safer sex decision, whether it's get on prep, use condoms, whatever it is. And then you like transcribe that and then we'd make a script out of it. So it was almost like a lot of the work that we did was always telling someone else's story and not really having my voice. And also then when you have grant restrictions, there's a lot of reasons. That, that's so, for me also why the sex positivity question threw me because that's something I'm always striving to do, but we work in schools all the time and we get funding from the federal government and like that becomes big no-nos. And so I was surprised that you found that in this piece and maybe because it's different fun. It's not like I didn't have the constraints in that way, but I, um, I found that surprising to hear that, so it like, threw me off. But going back to kind of letting someone else's voice sh um, shine, I think also working with youth, one of the first things that happened is someone that, I go between narrative and doc, is that they usually forgot my, um, scri my script the second they walked into whatever our set was. It was like, oh, what, what were we doing again? Oh, what is it? And then they would just kind of just chat and make it up there, and then we had a new script, and we would just go from there. So that really helped me just lose ego in a different way and be like, whatever comes, whoever shows up, whatever they say, as long as you get the gist of what we're getting at, we'll go with that. And I think that has helped me be a stronger filmmaker because I'm not trying to force as much. And so when it definitely comes to a doc space, and as someone that is not HIV positive, I really was like, this is not for me to tell someone else's story. And so I think that's a key piece of also why. And also, the second you meet Sian, it's like, OK. <laughs> She's going to lead the show. Uh, so I tried to step back as much. And even Angie, who had not, maybe she'd seen the first cut, because the first cut she wasn't um, in, she also, from the way she spoke, and maybe also what I cut of it, was a lot of like, I'll set the space, but then this is, this is for you to, to lead um, where the movement is going and is also the work that you do. Yeah, yeah very quickly, I think we're running out of time. But yes, I, I would say that uh, maybe the solicitation, the email that I sent, uh, you know, I was very open. Like, uh, send me anything you want. Don't overthink it. I keep saying that, don't overthink it, yeah. Uh, but I think in the end, I asserted a lot of control over the material that I got because there's there just so much, yeah, and there's no, yeah, I mean, uh, let's say one, someone else could totally edit, like, you could edit, you know, maybe like, I don't know, 50 versions of this. Yeah, based on, you know, your own history, investment, that kind of thing. Yes, I would say, I'm not sure, I mean, I did allow people to send me material, but it was me, do, you know, cause, you know, being a total top about putting all this together in the way that I, you know, that I saw, you know, yeah, what, you know, what spoke to me, yeah. It's the bossy bottom school of editing. Okay, huh? all right. <laughs> do we maybe have one more question? Can I say one quick thing? Yeah, sure. It and would just we'll, be, oh, I'm, so I'm so sorry. It would be amazing, and this is different because people were trusting you. I think your point was very important of like giving you this piece, but if you were to give like five to 10 different people, here's the footage and see what each person cuts, it would be so fascinating how their own personal experience would, and I imagine they would be radically different, so. Hi, I want to, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the, the uh, Beat Goes On, uh, which was about uh, Keith Seiler, and, um, because that is so important that we continue to tell the history of the work of activists that uh, I'm sure, if, if you're not part of the AIDS uh, community, education and activism community, they are just so key to where we are today. And uh, I appreciated that film. I knew Keith and uh, Eric and uh, Charles. Uh, and uh, I uh, just appreciate it. And I hope that you continue to put at least one piece in there that talks about the importance of the early activism work to where we are today. Please feel free to say no, but would you like to share your own particular relationship to that? You have such a important 
relationship to that history? Um, briefly, uh, oh, this theater, my son, Ray Navarro, uh, used to work in this theater. He started at MOCA when they first started at the temporary, when they first opened, and eventually he moved his way, they moved him up here, and he left here to go to New York and study at the Whitney Independent Study Program. While he was there, he, had di he was diagnosed with, at the time, AIDS-related complex. He died November 9th, 1990. I was there from March 90 till after he died, and I was involved with ACT UP, and that's what kept me going. Um, I don't know what people do today to keep themselves going emotionally, um, dealing with the anger. I was dealing with a lot of anger. I couldn't show it while, my, while I was in the hospital with my son, and I had to be professional with all the medical people. Um, the insurance that he had when he left MOCA kept him alive. That uh, COBRA policy kept him alive eight months longer than he should have. And I've gone on too long, but uh, you asked, so I'm not, telling you. Not I at mean, all that too long. keys in to where we are tonight. We're, th that's why I'm here. And uh, it's, uh, it's incredible. Yeah, I mean, his, his work is, is inspiring to so many of us, right? And the legacy that he left. Oh. So when Esther told me that you were here tonight, you know, I made a point. I was like, well, I gotta go talk to her afterwards. But <laughs> thankfully, you brought no. that the but, importance of remembering, right? Uh, but also being here but, together but, in the moment. So but thank the important you. thing is that you continue to tell the history mm -hmm. of how we got here, or the pe many people would not be alive today, including Greg. I knew Greg, mm -hmm. and uh, Greg recommended a medication when, when after Ray lost his sight, a visual artist lost his sight because of the medication. Greg Bordowitz educated me as to what the do doctors should be treating him with, and all that came from the activism of ACT UP and the education and the, um, uh, all the outreach that they did. But thank you, thank you, thank you. If you want to learn more about visual aids, they're based in New York, but they're working nationally and internationally. You can go to visualaids.org. Um, Esther and Kyle, as energetic and as hardworking as they are, have agreed to be open to, to engagement if you want to talk to them in the lobby. Um, thank you all for being here, and thank you for closing us on that great note, Ms. Navarro. And will you join me in thanking our amazing artists, please?